Hi, I'm Pamela Rucker, an instructor for Harvard Professional Development. I focus on coaching executives in the areas of leadership, strategy, and innovation. Welcome to Leading with Passion, a series honoring innovative small business leaders using their unique capabilities to improve people's lives. Today I'm joined by Ben Weintraub, CEO, board member, and co-founder of Kajit, a leading IoT connectivity services provider. Ben's work has enabled thousands of schools, healthcare providers, government organizations, and world-class enterprises to better connect with their students, employees, and customers. So Ben, welcome to the program. Yeah, I'm honored to be here. Now tell me about Kajit and what it is you do and how you happen to get there. Uh, so Kajit is an IoT connectivity service provider, uh, which means we provide cellular connectivity in a variety of use cases, including mm -hmm. education, healthcare, and transportation. Mm -hmm. But we didn't start off that way. We started mm -hmm. off with a, a passion for kids and, mm -hmm. and providing appropriate connectivity for them. And yeah. this was 20 years ago when we founded the company. And yeah. uh, the hottest thing in a kid's pocket was a Motorola Razor, which had no broadband. It was basically texting and yeah. uh, if you remember mobile WAP services, like a very rudimentary internet connection. Yeah. Um, but we saw what, what was going to happen. Uh, we knew that eventually they'd have supercomputers in their pocket, which is really true. Yeah. So we thought there was a necessity, although connectivity is good, you can have, it's not all good. You can have too much connectivity. You can have connectivity to inappropriate uh, items. So yeah. we wanted to provide a service which would manage that connectivity. And, and today that's still true even in other use cases. So our primary customers today are schools mm -hmm. and school systems who provide broadband to kids who don't have it at home. Mm -hmm. And then we also provide connectivity in other use cases. Generally what we're looking for is, is uh, uh, providing connectivity where it can be used for the good of society and also where we think that connectivity is, is uh, inevitable. In other words, all those in that use case, yeah. the connections will happen uh, over time. It's interesting. So you said that you started off wanting to work on controls for kids, and I imagine that if you can handle that for children, you can handle it for anybody, right? Because kids don't necessarily know what's safe, and yeah. sometimes you need to define that for them. Can you talk about how that sort of helps you with what you're doing today? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So with with kids, first of all, I would say we don't decide what's safe or mm -hmm. not. We provide the controls for the customer in the in the case of schools it's yeah. the school IT administrator defines what's what's appropriate um, but but when we what what uh, might not be appropriate for a kid that same control can be used to, to define what's appropriate for example an IOT connected device so mm -hmm. um, a, uh, a an ATM machine or a payment terminal or a wireless camera um, that needs to be secured um, that content that stream a healthcare device needs to go only to the healthcare provider, and yeah. so we prevent inappropriate content in the, in the sense of security. So, yeah. who can access that camera? Who can access that health data stream? Yeah. So those controls are equally applicable in other use cases. So, so take me back to the early days when you're first starting to work on these controls. Uh, what's going well, and what wasn't <laughs> going well? Yeah. So it was uh, it was a typical basement startup. It was literally. Uh, three dads in the basement of one of the dads' rooms. Really? Yeah, yeah, pre-funding. And um, we wow. went for almost 18 months developing the concepts and doing research and then taking it out to VCs to raise money. So there were a lot of trips out to Silicon Valley here where we, where we are now. Um, and, uh, um, you know, what went well, what didn't. I mean, it took a long time to get money. And, you know, what went well is uh, people bought into the concept. They really thought they saw this coming. They saw the trend in kids uh, getting connectivity, and then they knew that a, a, an appropriate type of service was was something that would, would work well. And, and, and I want to back up because in all of my research on you, I did not know that. I did not know it was three people in a in one room, yeah, trying to come up with a dream. And you know, we often talk about this idea of two guys in a truck or two guys in a garage trying to come up with ideas. What keeps you motivated in times like that when you're having challenges trying to get the company to grow? Oh, it's the customers. It's yeah. always the customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of hard times. Um, and it was three, I should mention, three dads founding the company. It was the company, Kajit, the company's name, Kajit, uh -huh. is an acronym over, of the kids' names or an anagram. Uh -huh. So K for Ken, A for Alex, and so on. The founder's kids are basically the form of the 
Khajiit name. I right. created the Khajiit name. Um, we, uh, you know, there were there were a lot of uh, things to overcome. Yeah. Not just the funding, but the distribution. Technically, and I'm the technical guy, so maybe it's easy for me to say this, but uh, building the service was actually the easy part. Mm -hmm. It was uh, designing the right kind of service, making it easy for customers to adopt. Um, making it easy for distribution to understand what the value proposition is to the customer. Those yeah. are the challenges. Yeah, and that's something a lot of small businesses struggle with too, right? Understanding where they can add value to other organizations. So how did you look at the opportunities for value? Where did you see those opportunities coming up for you guys? Uh, well, in the early days, um, penetration of cell phones in, in the kids sector wasn't even that high. Yeah. So it, it was a little tough, but, but when we, um, when you put the right device in a kid's hands, um, everybody got excited. Mm -hmm. And then when you showed them what you could do to make sure the, appro the content was appropriate, I think every parent wants to make sure the things their kid accesses, whether it's the internet, internet yes. or otherwise, their yes. experiences are appropriate experiences yes. that they can guide according to their standards. Yeah. Um, they become excited about it. It's interesting, as we've seen the proliferation of all of this um, access across the internet, video, data, you name it, there's a level of privacy that goes with that too and a level of controls yeah. that comes with that. And now, since everything that we do is probably built or, or sold or accessed or serviced somehow on a mobile device, there's all this data that goes with that too. It, it sounds like what you give people is mobility of that experience and not just mobility of the data. Is that correct? Um, that's, that's right. I, I mean, everything, uh, connectivity is essential. Mm -hmm. today and and uh it's a, fu a funny story on that is when schools were dismissed for covid um several things happened um uh, including the kids no longer had the internet that they would have had mm -hmm. in class mm -hmm. and they also didn't have uh for a lot of the students in the u.s free and reduced lunch so what some schools did is they took their buses and they drove them out to the communities and this is when kids weren't going to class and the buses provided two things food mm -hmm. and internet mm -hmm. and the internet was the khajiit internet Mm. Let's talk about how that evolves. How do you how do you find yourself in the middle of a global pandemic? Everybody has the <laughs> same problem, right? So it's not like you can come up some, with something that's going to change the world. How do you go from I want to control where kids get to on the internet to let me put internet on the bus, give them access to it, and feed them a meal? How does that come about? Um, well, we we had been providing. Wi-Fi on buses for a few years prior to COVID, so okay. it wasn't that hard for us because we knew the right um, the 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 right way to install Wi-Fi on the bus. Yeah. The the right equipment, the right antenna, the right, right. power integration, and right. so on. Um, and then the right way, the right carrier access and, yeah. and the content filtering. Yeah. Um, but we needed to do it really quickly with a lar in a large quantity yeah. um, during COVID. So the ch biggest challenges were probably getting equipment and getting out to the to to the school bus fleets to make the installations. What kind of uh, problems do kids have though? I can imagine if they don't have access to the internet, if they don't have access to food, how do they get around the bus to get all of that to happen? How did you manage that process? Oh, well, um, in schools, I, I have kids, uh, two of them are still in high school, and uh, their homework assignments, we live in Fairfax County, it's uh, you know middle class neighborhood in Virginia, yeah. and uh, they're they don't bring textbooks home anymore. Mm -hmm. They're all um, uh, internet-based, yep. all their learning. So yep. what that means is they, if they're on a bus ride or they're not at in the classroom, they have to have internet access. Right. So they can't pop open a textbook on the right. bus, for example. Right. Um, so it became essential to provide that service. And um, especially if you don't have internet at home, that, that was how you got internet. It was either at school or on the bus. And yeah. when there was COVID, there was no at school. It seems by, by providing that capability though, you, you sort of decrease the digital divide that we see happening across yeah. the country. How did you feel about being able to do that? Uh, that? That's a primary motivation. You asked earlier, you know, what motivates me and it's the customer. So mm -hmm. we've had the privilege uh, of seeing, uh, meeting students, meeting teachers, meeting school boards, and mm -hmm. when they're providing this kind of access, it, it's uh, it's a little interesting. It's, it sometimes gets emotional yeah. and our our, Employees love that as well. They'll go out to uh, help distribute items to a school. So typically, it's it's not a school bus that we're providing Wi-Fi to. We do that, but yeah. the more typical solution is handing a child 
a Chromebook with embedded LTE connectivity or mm. a hotspot with embedded connectivity. Mm -hmm. And then that connectivity goes through our platform, which then provides the monitoring, the filtering, the analytics. Mm -hmm. But uh, when when those distribution events happen, um, it's it's get, can, it can get emotional. It's very uh, energizing to yeah. see a kid, you know, walk home with a device and yeah. be able to, to use the internet and um, get access to all their educational content without any inhibitions. You, you touched on two things that, that stand out to me. One is that it's incredibly important to know the job to be done when you work with an organization and yeah. what it is you're trying to accomplish for them. And so functionally, yes, you are helping to provide these controls, but we all know in management theory that there's also the emotional job, right? And, and part of the emotional job, it looks like you're doing for your clients has been extended to your students to help them feel safe to help them feel like they have access, to help them feel connected, to help them feel yeah. wanted and valued by giving them this device that allows them to do what every other kid is able to do in the country. Yeah, th that comes across, came across clearly, especially during COVID, yeah. um, where we've had stories, and it, these were stories were in the news as well, but we right. were closer to them, so we had them more directly and they were more personal to us. Yeah. But stories of students sitting outside a McDonald's parking lot at mm. night, you know, at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. at night to get mm -hmm. internet access. Or they would go to the library, which closes at 6 p.m. or something, and they'd sit outside close enough to get access. And this right. is, you know, in the winter. It doesn't all weather conditions. Right. They would they would sit on a, you know, the concrete curb just to get internet access. Internet yeah. access. So it's much nicer for us to be able to say, hey, take the device, go home, sit at your dinner table, in a warm house, and yeah. you know, you get everything that the other kids get. Uh, what a visual, a visual you paint for that too. So, can you imagine a child having to sit outside in the cold near a McDonald's just to do their homework? No yeah, they're not going to be able to do as well. Right, you cannot succeed yeah. in that type of environment. So, I can see too then how this might allow some of your employees to really in love working there, because one of the, the jobs you have to do as a company is also to find ways to make the, the employees want to work at your organization, <laughs> yeah. right? It, yeah. To make it more than just a job. And we see for graduates that are coming out of college right now that many of them are saying that they don't just want to focus on money, they want to focus on mission. Yeah. And we see on earnings calls and growth opportunities that ESG has become a big part of this. And so by contributing to um, things that benefit society, you're finding ways for people to want to work for your organization. Is that true? I, yes, I'm, I think we built the company based on our passion. Yeah. At that time, all of our kids were young. Twenty years ago, my, you know, I, I basically had a two-year-old and, yeah. and one on the way. Yeah. Um, and that has certainly carried over. So I think someone told me once, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's easy to do a good job if you do good work. Mm. And so we have a mission that of providing connectivity for good. I, the tagline for Khajiit used to be, use it for good. We've evolved it because we're mm. no longer consumer focused. Mm -hmm. But... Um, that that theme has stayed with the company throughout throughout its years. Let me let me tap uh, double tap into that if I can. Right. So, what do you tell employees? How do, how do they figure out what <laughs> good it is that you do? When you say use it for good, what do you tell them when you interview them? What do you tell them when they join? That helps I, them. I think they know what our mission is because it's it's you know if you go to our website, it's obvious. We serve students, mm -hmm. and they get that. That's well known. When we talk about other situations like healthcare, it's actually the, a similar customer segment. It's system or similar problem. It's the digital divide. So yeah. um, there are underprivileged, underconnected individuals, communities, and what we're doing is bringing them the same services that you or I would have, especially yeah. again during COVID. So whether you had a telehealth visit with your doctor, mm. so you don't need to drive. If you're rural, you have to drive a long distance to get to the right uh, uh, practitioner. Yeah. You have to, um, in COVID, expose yourself to other people yeah. in, in that uh, in that location. Yeah. So we provided the same sort of access for them. And, and similar things happen in transportation or business continuity where we're making sure the business can continue to operate. We're making sure that um, we're helping the transformation from fossil burning vehicles to electric vehicles yeah. uh, by connecting the grids and, and the cars and the, and the charging stations. Um, so I think that gets across. It doesn't, it doesn't take too long to explain it to them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, what I do tell employees, uh, I give them an onboarding talk, yeah. uh, you know, a day or two in, and, uh, I, I say we have our culture and here's what it looks like and we have our mission and this is our mission statement. But at the end of the day, I tell them it's, it's, 
it's all about the work. It's all about serving customers. Yeah. We have good customers yeah. with important needs, and we need to deliver. Yeah. You, you can't let them down. So yeah. they're not letting me down if they don't do their job. That's not the impression I'm trying to leave with them. It's the customer. And, and when you say it that way and you, and you create the image of a kid sitting on a concrete uh, curb trying yeah. to get Internet access or an, an older uh, person in a rural, rural area who would have to drive to get to their, the proper doctor, the proper expert, yeah. um, it, that, that speaks for itself. So, so what it sounds like you're describing to me, number one, is motivation, right? There's a reason that the people want to do this. There's, there's definitely a value proposition to that. There's, there's a mission behind the things that you do. There's a story about how you got here and, and why you're doing and who you serve. There's messaging you give people so that when they join, use it for good, right? It, yeah. that, I love that term. And um, I'm assuming there's a measurement, right? So how do, how do you <laughs> know? that they're doing it for good. Because what you've described for me are these moments, right? All these moments where a kid might be outside of the, the bus or outside yeah. of McDonald's or a person might be trying to, do, to visit their doctor. How do you measure whether people have done good? Um, well, you're talking to an MIT grad. So I, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm heavy into numbers and, and my employees maybe, not, may, maybe don't like uh, they, they how may not heavily like I'm into numbers. <laughs> but uh, there, there are many, many ways to measure. Yeah. Um, we measure customers and retention rates and, um, and certainly revenue. Um, but we also measure things, and we, we display this directly to our customers, for example, homework hours. Mm -hmm. So we tell a, a client, a, an IT director at a school, when they log into our console, the first number they see is the number of homework hours completed over this time period, so nice. past seven days. Nice. And that is directly communicating to them, hey, I, I pay, I'm paying Khajiit for service, and I'm getting my value. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of analytics behind what is a homework hour. We're watching the websites they visit. You know, it's, yeah. it, if it's Khan Academy or their Pearson textbooks online yeah. and so on. So that's how we derive that number. But yeah. but that number, we we built that counter that that measurement a long time ago, and it, it's really resonated. And we then we try to do it into in other segments as well to find. You were talking about delivering something to customers that's simple, and that makes it simple because if you were just paying for gigabytes. If your measurement was gigabytes, that's somewhat meaningless. Right, that doesn't tell you very yeah. much. Yeah. So, so you said that uh, you love numbers, you love measurement, you love systems, you went to MIT. Tell me about your path in life. How did you get to the place where you were working with Khajiit? Um, well, going back from where I am today, I was working in wireless, um, and then I met the two other dads yeah. who wanted to build this particular service for kids. So that 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 nugget of an idea came from Daniel, my, uh -huh. my partner and the chairman of our company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the idea of building the platform behind it to, okay. to deliver on that vision. Okay. Um, but before then, I was uh, a, a nuclear engineer in the Navy mm. and uh, another highly quantitative job. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that's, those are the really, I've only had three jobs in my life, college uh, in aerospace, studied uh -huh. aerospace, uh -huh. a nuclear engineer in the Navy uh -huh. for seven years, and then uh, a wireless job in retail, so that was more allowed me to understand the technology and distribution, and then building the Khajiit platform. So, so let me just say thank you for your service. Oh, I, I, you. I, I see this, uh, this idea of service and society and systems all coming together in your life, right, that lead you up to what you're doing right now at Khajiit. Do you see that? Uh, yeah, you could say it that way, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know, sit back and think about it like that, but uh, that's probably accurate. That's a beautiful thing, though, because I'm, I'm very interested in how people got to where they are and why it is they think the way that they do. And the fact that you say that you love the measurement, you love to build a platform for the vision, you love the things that you're working on, definitely tells me that you love these complex adaptive systems that can sometimes be pretty wicked, right? The more you touch them, the worse they get. And you have to love trying to unravel all of that, trying to yeah. figure all of that out. But I, I, I additionally like the fact that there's a service component for society in it and that you realize that even if I do solve this problem, I'm solving this problem for someone other than just the organization that yeah. I work with. I'm trying to make the world a better place. No, that, that, I agree with that. There, there's a lot of good connectivity can do a at all levels. I mean, just monitoring uh, machinery and making sure it continues to run, right? Yeah. That, that could mean the difference between having a power outage or not having a power yes. outage. Yes, yeah. Um, and having sensors and collecting that data requires a network. Yeah. And today, connectivity 
often means wireless. Yeah. And so cellular cellular wireless expands the 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 use cases where you can collect the data that keeps all that critical infrastructure going. So we're just trying to help with that and we're picking when we go to market, we don't just say, hey, buy cellular connectivity from Kajid. We have security and we have a platform with controls. Right. We try to look at each use case and then deliver it in a very specific fashion. So no one else that I know of will say, we'll sell you, sell a school, sell your connectivity that, sa that has a measurement of homework hours. Yeah. They just don't do that. Yeah. Um, when we look at healthcare, we have similar uh, metrics and delivery in, in, in the way we bring the, so the solution to the customer where they're getting exactly what they need in the right packaging with the right hardware right. Um, so that they can immediately put it to use. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to worry about all the cellular technology, all the complexities that you're talking about. Let me let me ask you about this idea of connectivity because I know COVID gave all of us a burning platform, right? There's a reason we all had to be connected in the way that we were and a lot of strides were made toward um, students being able to go to school online, telehealth and so forth. Do you see people continuing in that direction or are they backsliding a little bit? It's a little bit of a backslide. I think schools are, they have a lot to worry about. Uh, mm -hmm. Safe schools is a hot topic these days. That, mm -hmm. all, that by the way, also can be uh, uh, helped with with sensors and you know teachers are carrying badges around today that they can just push a button to immediately notify that there's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there there's some backtracking. But I think the COVID woke the entire country up to this digital divide yeah. that had always existed and still yeah. exists today. Even with all the funding that was generated during COVID, mm -hmm. there's still millions of kids without appropriate broadband access at home. Sometimes due to coverage it, mm -hmm. you know they live in an area where it's just very very difficult to provide coverage mm -hmm. and other times simply due to economic reasons mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it's still a problem schools are still working to fix that problem yeah. uh, they're just challenged with a lot of different issues yeah. but but if if schools connecting kids was here pre-covid like this big of a uh, they were solving it this amount they they did it to that degree in covid and they've come back but yeah. they're still solving it order you know factors above where they were before COVID. yeah way better than they were before yeah, yeah so so let me ask you then so what do you see then given what you do as growth areas for your organization where are you able to go back and do some additional good uh well that's where we can look at other segments so we had actually thought uh created it's funny if i look back at my 2020 uh uh, notes for the company. I, I deliver goals for the year and, mm -hmm. and those goals were delivered in December of 19, 2019. And <laughs> those goals included, let's go explore enterprise applications. Yeah. And that got thrown out the window in March of 2020 <laughs> because we, it was all we could do to barely keep up with the demand for yeah. schools. And of course yeah. that was what we wanted to be doing. So, yeah. um, we've, there are other segments like we've, like we've talked about and, yeah. and, we're just trying to find the right ones where we can dive deep, understand those segments, and deliver the holistic solution. When, when we started with education, we hired former teachers, bus drivers, principals to really deeply understand their needs yeah. and put ourselves in their, in their shoes. And uh, it, it takes time to do that. So we're, that's why we don't just provide this broad horizontal platform. We try to understand each segment. You know, I love the fact that you said that one of the things you provided was this this shrink wrap solution where you just open it up and it works for the kid, right? And I can yeah. see how in a lot of different industries that might work because we know from management theory that one of the reasons people don't use products is that, look, it's just too hard. Yeah. I don't know how to use it. I don't know how to set it up. I don't know how to create it. This idea that I can deliver it to you in the moment and it just works can probably benefit a lot of different industries and a lot of different segments of society. Do you see how that might be useful somewhere else outside of school? Yeah, certainly, certainly. If you're, for example, wh when we talk about healthcare, there are two specific use, healthcare is a very broad term, mm -hmm. but there are two specific use cases we look at. And this is just an example of trying to answer your question. So one of them is the telehealth that we were talking about earlier, but another is re remote patient monitoring. Mm -hmm. So there are numerous devices. You can walk into a CVS and there are probably 20 digital devices for blood pressure and yes. blood oxygen and, and uh, um, but they don't, automatically report back to your care provider. They don't automatically log information. Mm -hmm. because th There may be Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connected devices, but then your 80-year-old mom, in my case, I, uh, she, there's no way she's going to connect that device to the yeah. internet. Yeah. So when we provide cellular connectivity, we're looking at that use case, trying to make it simple. 
for the device manufacturer who's not an expert in cellular. They mm -hmm. don't know coverage. They don't know antenna structures. They yeah. don't know FCC certification requirements. Yeah. Um, they don't know about how to implement security in the stream, in the cellular data stream. Yeah. Um, so you've got a relatively dumb IoT device that is not running Norton antivirus, right? It's just it's just sitting on the internet yeah. on a cellular connection. That becomes a little scary. Yeah. We make sure that they can get the right cellular module, the right network, the right antenna, and the right security on that device, and we take care of that. And all they have to worry about is the healthcare element. And it seems to me when you start to do tech, do when you start doing tech for good like that the stakes go way up, right? Because if you flub up for a regular system environment, <laughs> that might be a problem. But flubbing up with healthcare, or flub flubbing up with school or something else, yeah. the, the risk is much higher. How do you deal with creating solutions in such a high pressure environment it, like that? It's interesting because if you had asked me a few years ago if I wanted to be, um, we, and we have other use cases, including first responder use cases. Yeah. If you had asked me if I wanted, I would have told you a few years ago, I don't want to be in that space yeah. because there's too much risk. and and. I, in the nuclear engineering world, I've, I've experienced that risk. Yeah. Um, so, but, but we have evolved the platform over the years. So the, the years of hardening and improving and scaling and uh, making the platform redundant and then just, just pure experience yeah. of, of so many hundreds of thousands of connections and terabytes of data a day <laughs> and you know, uh, looking at our outages and how the system handles it and how it's redundant and um, that that gives me the confidence to deliver to these other use cases. So th everything you're saying to me though, seems like it matches your background, that love of systems, <laughs> that love of service, because for me, that would be terrifying. That much data, I would hate to have the responsibility of managing that because of the, c of the concern that I would yeah. drop that, right? Uh, there are a lot of good people on our team. Yeah. And uh, I certainly don't do it alone. I, I, I joke around, today I simply, Push. I'm an HR person who pushes a lot of email around because mm. all I do is really hire people and, and integrate the team and help help them find the right direction. But but yeah, we have a lot of good people that take care of all the things that you mentioned. How do you find the right people for mission-based work? Like oh, that's that? that's tough. That's um, probably I'd say most employees are are word of mouth. They're friend mm -hmm. referrals. Mm -hmm. and referrals from existing employees or just people in our network. Mm -hmm. um, we have vendors, customers. Um, and a lot of times people come in through those channels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So take me through what a typical day would be like then. So if, if, you're, going, if you're getting up and, and your uh, dashboard is going off and you're trying to respond, what's a typical day like for you? Uh, well, I typically get up around 4.20 in the morning and then I go to CrossFit and that that's kind of <laughs> sets me up for the day because I come home from that energized and ready to go. And, th and then I'll just, I'll, I'll just start off. I get, you know, my, my two in high school are pretty much self-sufficient, so although I'd love to walk them to school, they absolutely don't want that anymore. Uh, right. <laughs> so they pretty much just want me to go, go do my job. Um, and uh, I guess mo mostly at the office, I'm trying to repeat the same themes again and again because mm. more people, you know, speaking of information overload, it's not just for kids, it's for employees too. Like yeah. th there are all kinds of distractions and there's too many different methods of communication, too much mm -hmm. information coming through those methods of communication, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to stay focused on the, you know, the top five. Mm -hmm. And so that's most of my day, I'd say, is just keeping people focused on the task at hand. I, I understand the mission, the message, the motivation, I understand the moments you're getting. I do not understand 4.20 in the a.m. <laughs> <laughs> well, how I go to bed around by 10. But <laughs> is, that, is, that a, is that a holdover from your military background, having to get up, or have you always been a person that's an early riser like that? Uh, I was not an early riser in college, except perhaps because the Navy made me get up, yeah. the ROTC made me get up early. But uh, no, I, th I call it old man syndrome. I don't know what it is, but I, I do <laughs> naturally get up early and go to bed early. Oh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me switch and pivot a bit to the future. I mean, when, when I heard you talking about the fact that you guys supplied internet on the buses, my mind immediately went to, what could the growth opportunity be there? Um, have you guys thought at all about going into autonomous vehicles and, and looking at where the world may be going in terms of oh, that? Oh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an area with a lot of connectivity needs and yeah. so much information with autonomous driving and um, you know route information and vehicle telemetry and diagnostics yeah um, we're not in that space because it's crowded mm. because there are already a lot who are focused on it and that's fine I would expect that to happen right yeah. we, we specialized in education 
and there's really no one else who specializes in education. But yeah. in, in vehicles, the type of vehicle connectivity you're talking about, it's it's there are there are people who got there first, and that's great. You know, yeah. they know it better than I do at this point, and yeah. I don't really want to try to catch up. Yeah, that's I love the point that you're making though too. Knowing knowing exactly where to play and how to win is an important part of any management theory that you look at, right? Knowing who your real customers are and where you really provide value, and, yeah. and the fact that you said, hey, someone beat us there. They probably know it better than I do, but nobody's doing this particular thing as well as we're doing it, and that's, I think, our sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you another one, though. What about the idea of uh, connecting for growing, uh, uh, for agriculture, for growing food and, and using the Yeah, that, that we, so that's, that is interesting to us. It, it um, higher productivity, less water use, less fertilizer use. There's a lot of sensors, a lot of data that, that comes with that. Yeah. That data can, th there are a lot of sources for the data, including the satellite imagery and so on, but, but cellular connectivity plays a role, and we have customers who do that. Yeah. Um, so we are looking at that. We're looking at the special needs. I haven't gotten too smart on that, so I can't yet, but I can't, so I can't talk in detail. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is interesting to us. That idea of, of, of systems and service and society plays really well into that. Um, if I were to cast a, a, a light into the future and say, what do you wish you were doing with this, this technology later on? What would you want to do with it if you didn't have any limitations? <laughs> um, I, I would say I, I would like the story that I think has played out with schools. Mm -hmm. which is years of figuring out the segment and then watching it hit its hockey stick mm -hmm. and then basically feeling good that, hey, we, we, we had the right target. We had the right solution for that. Um, we were on target with our solution and the need, yeah. and then all of a sudden everybody adopted it. And it mm -hmm. would be nice to see that happen in these other use cases. Yeah. And then we'll go to the next use case and the next use case. I think there's no cellular connectivity is is in its own sort of heyday right now with there's not just macro networks, there are private networks. Um, you c the government has licensed Spectrum in a different way, so anyone can create, you could create a cellular network at your home, or we could connect, create one here in, in a day. Yeah. And that provides a whole bunch of new opportunity. So yeah. just, just looking at the different use cases and then seeing them come to fruition. I don't, I don't have a you know, big vision of going to Mars or anything like that, yeah. but that, that would be nice. Do you have a, fav a favorite industry that you'd, you'd, you'd really prefer? To be in with yeah. our solution, yeah. Um, I, I I think healthcare is great. I think yeah. the ones we're in. If if I knew of a better one, I'd be working on it. Yeah, put yeah. it that way. Um, I want to go back to what you just said about what you wished would happen. So, if you could put together a solution that everybody would use, you said that would be great, right? And and it seems like you put your finger right on the pulse of what people needed right when they needed it. If you take yourself back to the time that you were in then. What's something that you wish you knew then? It that always you takes longer. Knew now. Yeah, it always takes longer. Say more about that. Why? It, it, so in '03, we created the company to serve kids with cell phones. Yeah. And um, as a consumer product. Yeah. And that happened a little bit later than we thought. So we spent money and time. I think it's just better to know that you know patience is good and. It takes it takes more more time more money to get done what whatever you think it is that shouldn't deter you from having the energy and passion to drive you know drive yeah. hard every day yeah. but it's good to have that balance that with a bit of pragmatism of okay well it's good to be a little bit early not you know not too early not too late yeah so that's kind of that finding that the poor just right mix is is an important concept yeah I think that's such an important point for business owners too though that even though you are out there running your business or if you're leading an organization and you control a lot of things, sometimes you can't control how long it takes yeah. or how much it costs, no matter how much you try to. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes what it takes, right? And so how do you develop the patience to know that? Is it just through experience that you've learned that? Is that <laughs> your nature? How do, you, how do you manage that? Because I know a lot of leaders struggle with that, that they, they aren't able to control as much as they would like yeah. to. Uh, that's a tough one. There, there, there are a lot of unknowns, um, but there were a lot of unknowns in, in my other disciplines in, in the nuclear world. There were, I, it, it's an interesting contrast because, I think people think the nuclear, power plant world is, everything ex is exactly known, uh -huh. but that's not how plants were designed. I mean, we know a lot, and we know a lot more today than we did, fifty years ago when the first nuclear power plants were built by the Navy, but. Uh -huh. 
um, you basically create a range of val expected values and you have to operate within that range. So yeah. it, we don't know if it's going to be here or if it's going to be there, but it still needs to work. Yeah. And so there's some, in, in the entrepreneurial world, I, I like to think of it as you're riding that edge between mm. uh, going too fast, spending too fast, wh whatever it is, a, a, of disaster, and then just not doing enough. Yeah. And sometimes I think you need to think of the edge as it's not actually a sharp edge. It's a wide range. And you might want to be on that plateau so that just in case things don't go well, you're okay. Or if they go great, you're also prepared for that. It's, it's a hard balance. That's a, that's a <clears throat> great way to think about it, though, Ben, because I often hear people thinking about being on the cutting edge or the bleeding edge, and it's almost as either you're there and you fall off, or you're yeah. there and you, you, you die or someone takes you out. This idea that the edge actually has a flat surface to it where you can exist in, and have some variability in things that you don't normally think you have variability in is an important point, right? Because things may not always go the yeah. way that you would expect them to. And there's also just luck sometimes. It's luck, and luck, luck, luck favors luck. the prepared, right? Luck favors the prepared, right? And you can do the same things that other people did, but have a completely different result yeah. just because of luck. You're such a, such a great point. Uh, on that note, though, as we're closing out, what's the thing you think of you've been luckiest at in life? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't really think of it that way. Uh, luckiest at? I mean, in the company, we were... Um, we were lucky to have built all these platforms, mm -hmm. in, in, and uh, at the time we did, I think for for what's going on with cellular, the adoption, the hockey stick, and all all the industries. Mm -hmm. um, looking forward, probably the luckiest thing was realizing that the adoption would be massive, mm. uh, I, and that it, the three of us sitting in the basement talking about what does this really look like, yeah. and then talking to we probably did seventy VC pitches for our A round. Yeah, Ooh, and uh, just re-explaining. <laughs> yeah, it was. A, it took a little while, but uh, we asked for a lot of money back then. Um, but just explaining and re-explaining yeah. where we thought the world was headed. Yeah, really refined that yeah. thinking, that yeah. vision, and we were. I mean, I don't know, lucky, not lucky, skilled, but that all of that together really helped us formulate what we th what the cell cellular connected world would look like. On the other side of that, I mean, luck, luck just happens, right? There are other things you work really hard for and you try to make achieve, um, you try to make come about. What are you proudest of? What's the, the achievement you're most proud of for Kajit? Oh, it's definitely connecting the schools. I mean, for the kids and, and yeah. getting phone calls. So the, the bus solution came from Miami, uh, uh, sorry, USD, Miami School District. Uh, calling us one day and saying, "Hey, I need to put Wi-Fi on a bus mm. for the because this use case, this thing was going to happen, and we I had to have Wi-Fi on it. Yeah. And it took us ten days to go from not knowing how to do it to installed in the bus driving around. Wow! And uh, that's because we had all the right people and the equipment, and obviously the platform of cellular connectivity and controls was already there. So yeah, um, we've certainly refined it since then. But yeah. but the the way the team jumped to the to the need was amazing." That's a great story. I love the way that you're making the world a better place for children and, and hopefully healthcare and, and all of the other industries you'll be getting into. Yeah, thank you. I hope to bring that all to fruition. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.